All right, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. We uh, finished up chapter 12 uh, last Wednesday night, and uh, tonight we're going to enter into chapter 13. And as we studied last week, we saw how that the kingdom of God was portrayed as uh, the Son of God being born of a virgin was ready to be delivered and Satan uh, stood forth to try and destroy him and we saw the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of evil and how that a third of all the angels were drawn with Satan when he fell and uh, the Lord uh, gives us the promise that we shall have the victory. Now, we come to chapter 13 and we uh, come to a place where we deal with uh, the, the revelation of dealing with the Antichrist. Now, as you're going to notice in chapter 13, uh, it doesn't uh, talk about uh, the dragon or the serpent the way it did in chapter 12. And it's going to talk about the Antichrist. Now, I believe that as you're going to read this and study this, you're going to see that the Antichrist is comes in a two-part uh, power. It comes in civil and religious. Uh, that is the power of the world and the power of false religion. Uh, since the time of Constantine, when Constantine wedded, uh, the church, uh, the so-called churches with the state, and then he began to use his power uh, to make laws over the churches. That's really when their departure from the faith uh, really went into overtime. They began to, you know, the celibacy of the priesthood and uh, the self-indulgences and all these various wicked sins that... Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has participated in and, and I'll just be straight up with you I don't know of any other institution in the world religiously speaking that fits the Antichrist better than the Roman Catholic Church and if you go back four or five hundred years and you read the commentaries of our old Baptist and uh, the writings of those that were before Darby uh, you'll find that they all believe that. They, they put pressure on the Catholic Church by preaching that the papacy and the church were the Antichrist. And they preached that people should pull out of it if they were saved and not be a part of her because she is drunken with the blood of the saints and she's never changed and never will change. Now, God can save people in that organization. And I'm not, not saying that everybody's a Catholic is lost because I believe God has even some people that are Catholics that are saved. But they've seen beyond what their religion teaches and they've seen Christ and have believed. And then you, you uh, see that they will eventually grow if they hear the truth and pull out of that as God opens their heart to truth. Now look with me in verse 1 of chapter 13. I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now again, we, we notice this idea, the sand of the sea. In, uh, for the Jews, uh, they looked upon the sea as being very mysterious. Now in the uh, Old Testament, they had a navy, but they sought to get their uh, sailors from Tyre because there weren't many Jews that were willing to go out on the sea uh, in the Old Testament because they looked upon it as being very dark and mysterious. And so the sand of the sea carries the idea of that which is moving. If you've ever been out on the sea, the ocean, uh, about uh, one out every two times I get on a boat on the ocean, I get seasick. Uh, but I love it. I used to love it. We used to take our vacations and I'd go fishing 
and uh, catch enough fish to pay for our trip down there and back. And but I would usually get sick about one out of two times, and uh, so it was rough. But I loved it. But here the sea is speaking of that which is moving. Perhaps it's talking about the sea of humanity because human beings fluctuate their ideas. I mean, look at some of the things that are going on today. Uh, you know, the, that little group of kids from the Catholic school in Covington, and they went wearing their hats to make America great again. And uh, this uh, Indian came up and started beating his drum right in this little boy's face. And he didn't do anything or say anything uh, that was out of the way. But uh, they blew it all out of portion, and, and he's gotten death threats and everything over it. Uh, people are, are, have lost their minds. And uh, I don't know why people have so much hatred and bitterness, uh, and we see it from the top to the bottom. It's just uh, something. There, there needs to be uh, something done where we stop fighting each other and calling each other names and love each other and pray for each other. We have differences, but we're Americans. And we ought to be able to have, you know, enough unity to uh, love each other and pray for each other. So the beast rises out of the sea. He, uh, I saw a beast rise up. Notice it says, out of the sea. And it has seven heads. Now seven is the number of completeness. And 10 is also another number that often reflects uh, completeness. So it has seven heads, and on the seven heads it has 10 horns. Now, uh, some of the ancient writers believe that there were seven heads, and the one head in the middle had the 10 horns. But then other people who sketched this uh, they spread out the horns uh, upon uh, the heads. But nevertheless, it's talking about something powerful, something that has great uh, authority and power and accomplishes terrible things. And it says upon his head the name of blasphemy. Now you know uh, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a whole study in itself and, uh, but I believe that the sin, uh, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was a sin that could only be committed in the first century because those people who saw the miracles of Jesus and listened to him teach and then they attributed that work to the devil, Jesus in the context said that they had committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't, as human beings uh, today, we don't live in the presence of Jesus like they did. But they saw him and they heard him, and yet they claimed that he was of Beelzebub, and, uh, which is interpreted the God of the flies, and uh, that he was a false teacher. But anyway, this, this that comes out of the sea, this beast, has blasphemy written upon its head upon his heads the name blasphemy so it seems to indicate that each head had the name blasphemy cursing the name of God uh, speaking evil of God and folks if you know much about the Bible this happens all the time anything that opposes Christ and is against Christ is an antichrist anything that says well Preacher comes up and preaches that you're saved by works. Let's say he believes you're saved half by grace and half by works. That's a message of Antichrist. Because we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And it's not of works lest any man should boast. Amen. You're saved entirely by the work of grace. But many people teach that baptism washes away your sins. That's a message of Antichrist. They teach that the Lord's Supper has a part in your salvation. That's the message of Antichrist. Any message that is opposite or instead of Christ is a message of Antichrist. 
We're going to talk about that a little more here in a few moments. So he appears from the sea. Blasphemy is all over his heads. And the beast which I saw... Now, now he takes some illustrations from the book of Daniel. We studied this. Uh, we've been studying this uh, on uh, Sunday afternoons. And uh, we've seen this uh, seen several times in the book of Daniel. He has, first of all, uh, was like a leopard. Now, a leopard is not the largest of the cats, but it, it has great agility and it's able to climb. It can kill an animal that weighs more than it does and climb a tree with that animal and put it in a tree so that it can eat it and nothing else can get it. A leopard is a very cunning uh, cat and it's capable of, of killing. Uh, there have been some instances I read uh, where that a, a leopard has killed uh, in one case, seven human beings were killed by one leopard in an attack. They're, they're that kind of uh, destructive animal if, if you don't have protection from them uh, because of their power and their, their speed. And so he's a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. Now, we all know that a bear has big feet. Uh, these big uh, Kodiak bears from Alaska, you know, probably one of their feet would almost fill up this whole top of this pulpit. Uh, their, their feet are enormous. And uh, this speaks of power. You know, they say that when these big bears are running at you, you can almost feel the earth shake because their feet are so powerful. And uh, they, can, they can take one swipe of their, their foot and knock an elk's head off its body with one swipe. I mean, that's it's just amazing, but they, they say this is true. Uh, and then notice it says, its feet were as the feet of a bear, its mouth was as the mouth of a lion. Now there's no other creature on earth that has the force and voice of a lion. When a lion roars, I mean, uh, it just causes your whole body to shake when a lion roars. I've been in the zoos. I've never seen one out in the wild, but I've been in zoos and heard them roar. And man, I'm telling you, uh, it, it'll scare you. Uh, but these lions are, are very powerful, and it has the mouth of a lion, so the, the, usually the mouth is what the lion uses to break bones. And, you know, they're very strong uh, one of the strongest of all the animals. I think the alligator or the crocodile has the strongest bite force, but uh, the bear is not far behind. And then also notice, the dragon gave him his power and his seat. So he's separate from the dragon. Remember the dragon was referring to Satan, and here the dragon gives him power and his seat, which means his place of authority. When uh, the angel of the Lord came to Sodom, the Bible says that Lot sat among the leaders in Sodom. He had a place of authority. And so the dragon gives this antichrist, this beast, uh, the seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast now this refers to the fact that the beast seemingly has invincible powers uh, it, it has one of its heads uh, delivered a, a blow that would have ended its life but uh, it healed its own wound and uh, it was able to recover. Um, you know, they, they say that uh, a lot of different animals like uh, 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 turtles, snapping turtles. I remember as a kid we had a creek and there were big snapping turtles. And my grandpa would reach in under the banks and pull them out and uh, we'd eat turtle soup and so forth. But I remember one time he had had a hook in one's throat 
and uh, he had done tried to kill that thing and it got loose and then a week or two later I saw it in the in the creek and it was live and doing great uh, you know some of these animals would if it was something happened to us would die but uh, Satan gives power to this uh, creature and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast so that their allegiance is to Satan and they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him and there were given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months you know when, when somebody says that Mary was the mother of God that's blasphemy I believe that's blasphemy and all you have to do is if you ever turn on the mass or you listen to any Catholic priest one of the chants that they will say is pray for us sinners Mary mother of God and they repeat this Mary mother of God you know what they're saying they're saying that Mary must have had the qualities of God herself and therefore making her the mother of God Mary was the mother of Jesus. She was not the mother of God because she was a, a human being that had a depraved nature and she conceived by the Holy Ghost. When you say uh, things such as, uh, you know, that Jesus <clears throat> Christ was... Uh, that he had other that he that he didn't have other brothers and sisters and you try to say that Mary was a perpetual virgin that's blasphemy because the bible teaches that Mary had other children and uh, but Jesus was the only one born of a virgin so there are many other things we could talk about he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So everything that represents the truth, this uh, Antichrist attacks. Now, we know that there are some things that Catholics, Roman Catholics believe. You know, they do believe in the sanctity of human life. They don't believe in abortion. I appreciate that. And uh, they do take a stand. Uh, most of them do for... Uh, uh, marriage between one man and one woman uh, rather than uh, homosexuality or lesbianism I'm not saying that everything about them is bad but the things that deal with salvation are in place of Christ they are designed to keep people in bondage so that they're in bondage to the church and therefore they're able to manipulate people and bring in large sums of money. We don't manipulate people. We don't try to put you in bondage. Uh, we, we teach the truth. The people serve the Lord because they love Him, because they want to do it, not because they're forced to do it in order to be saved. And it was given unto Him to make war with the saints. Now here's where it really becomes evident. Uh, <clears throat> I left my trail of blood out in the car, but I've been reading the Trail of Blood this week again, and every time I read it, uh, I don't know if we think we had a few copies, but we need to order some more. Uh, every every Baptist ought to read the Trail of Blood and uh, see how the saints were put to death. Uh, also, Martyrs' Mirrors, if you ever see that out in a bookstore. Uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs is another good one. Uh, and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations so this antichrist had power over uh, he, he caused saints to be put to death they had power over all tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so you mark it down. If your name was not written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world, you will worship the Antichrist 
you'll be a part of his ideas and his theology eventually. But if you are one of God's elect, he will lead you to the gospel and show you that you're saved by grace through faith. So the dragon appears from the sea, or the Antichrist from the sea. Uh, it gives authority in verses uh, 3 through 10. And uh, we see that uh, all that are not written in the Lamb's book of life will worship him. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Now let's delve into this Antichrist with what time we have left here. Uh, there are five times in the Bible where the word Antichrist is used. This is an important study, and I wish every member of our church could be here uh, to hear this because we need to know this. And I want to take you for just a few moments uh, through these verses and talk about the Antichrist and what the Bible teaches. Turn with me to the book of Second John, uh, chapter, the book of First John, chapter two, and verse eighteen. First John, <clears throat> chapter two. Verse 18. Now remember John is, is writing to Christians and uh, he's writing to uh, those who have been dispersed. And he writes about uh, many things like the gospel of John. And he says in verse 18, little children, it is the last time. Now what does that mean? The last time uh, means the last age. The last uh, of the period of time before the coming of Christ. Now, when did John write that? Well, he wrote that some 2,000 years ago. And 2,000 years ago, as we've told you, that we believe that from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ is referred to as the last days. Even though in the book of Jude, it talks about at the very end of those days that Satan will be released for a little period to wreak havoc upon uh, those upon the earth. But then he'll be chained up and destroyed in the lake of fire where he, where he will suffer through all eternity. But he says, now little children, it is the last time. So if it was the last time 2,000 years ago, what does that tell us? We're still in the last time. We're in the very dregs of the last time. You know how you drink your cup of coffee and you get to the bottom and uh, you get those dregs in the bottom and usually just pour it out. You don't drink it. Uh, and uh, that, that's what we're talking about. We're in the dregs. We're in the very end. Uh, so he says, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, what? You have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many antichrists. Now that tells us that rules out the entirety of there ever being one single antichrist. There are many. You see, whether you be whatever false religion you're in, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ was the only Savior, that He was sent from heaven, that He was virgin born, that He was the only Redeemer who died, was buried, and raised from the dead, if we believe any other gospel, we don't believe the message of Christ. And it's an antichrist message. Because you'll be damned if you believe it. If you believe salvation is 1% of your works, you're lost. It's all of grace. And so he said, little children, there are many antichrists, and they shall come. There are many now whereby we know that it is. We know. That's the word gnosko. That means to know by experience. You know, when, when Adam knew Eve, his wife, she bore him a child. It's to know intimately. We know by the, the things we see around us that the coming of the Lord is drawing nigh. Little children, it is the last time. So, 
John saw them in his day. Remember in, in, in third, third John, Diotrephes wanted to have the preeminence in the church and he was casting out uh, uh, people who wanted to try and serve the Lord, wouldn't help missionaries and so forth. He was a very wicked man. And uh, there, remember they had their debate in Acts 15 about circumcision. Some believe that circumcision saved you. Many of the Jews believed in their message of Judaism. Listen, uh, you know, I love Jews and I love all races. But Judaism does not have the answer. Judaism is a message of works for salvation. And it is an Antichrist message. Now I don't say that in, in hatred. I say that in love. That I want people to come to them. If I'm wrong. I challenge anybody. To come and show me that I'm wrong. From the word of God. I'll sit down and talk with anybody. About this. If we use the word of God. And there is no compromise. When it comes to this. There are many Antichrists. Whereby we know. It is the last time. So if it was the last time then, it's definitely the last time now. And there are many antichrists. And we see them. But the, the head, the head of all of this false teaching has primarily been uh, from the Roman Empire. The Roman Catholic Church took its power and continued to grow though the Roman Empire fell. The Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox and other branches of Catholicism continue to grow and they have sway over people all over the world. Here in America and places. Catholicism is very powerful. Uh, the coach of Kentucky, John Calipari, that, who I think a lot of and he's a great basketball coach, but uh, you know he's, he's Roman Catholic. And I pray for him that God will open his eyes and he'll come to see that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and it's by grace alone. There were a couple times I got to go to a Kentucky game. One time I got to sit by Rick Pitino's son. He's now a coach at Minnesota. And uh, I witnessed to him, shared the gospel with him. And I gave him this uh, gospel tract and I gave him a book, Why Be a Baptist? And I said, does your dad read to you at night? He said, yeah, he does sometimes. I said, give him this book and ask him to read this book to you tonight or the next time. And he said, I will. And uh, I prayed for him that he would have read it and the Lord might open his heart and save him. But uh, he too was involved in Catholicism. And uh, Catholicism doesn't have the answers. Now again, I don't say this in hatred. I say it in love. I say it because I care enough. Now I know I'll get criticized. I know that the devil will come after me for preaching this. I know that I'm going to face persecution from it. But that's okay because people need to hear the truth. Amen. Now, turn with me just uh, chapter 2 verse 22. Just read down a few verses. He goes on the same subject. Who is a liar? but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is an antichrist. If you deny that Jesus is the Christ, and you say, okay, what does the word Christ mean? Okay, In the Greek, that's the word Christos, the anointed one. He was the anointed one of the Father. There's no other one who was the anointed one. He's the Messiah. When Mary... Uh, was told by the angel that she would bear a child. She was told that he would be the Messiah. The promises of the prophets that said Christ would come. So he says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Um, he is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. I talked to Jehovah's Witnesses the other day and uh, I told them I said I'll give you five minutes and you give me five minutes 
I'm not going to argue with you, but I will. I'll listen to you if you'll listen to me. And he said, okay. So I said, you can go first. And he started out. And I said, tell me how to be saved. Tell me how I can go to heaven when I die. And he started talking about, he didn't have it. I mean, I felt sorry for the man. He didn't know anything about how to be saved or how to come to know God or how to know in my heart that my sins were washed away. And then one of the first questions I asked him, I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ was God in flesh? <clears throat> he said, no, Jesus was the Son of God. I said, so you don't believe that Jesus was God incarnate? He said, no. He was God's Son. And I said, well, you're an antichrist. You don't believe the very heart of the gospel. And we went on to talk about some other things. But if you deny the deity, the Godship of Christ. He was in the beginning with the Father. All things were made by Him and for Him. And without Him nothing was made that was made. Amen. He was the second person of the Godhead. He always existed from all eternity. Amen. He was the Ancient of Days. And when He came into this world... He came as the redeemer of sinners. He is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So any organization that denies the deity of Christ is antichrist in place of Christ or opposed to Christ or against Christ. There's no room for two people on the throne. He sits on the throne. And you know where my place and your place is? At his feet. Amen. At his feet. Worshiping the great king. Now, look over just a couple pages to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not. Now he's saying it's not only that you believe. But now he's saying if you don't confess. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Is not of God. If you do not believe in the Godship of Christ. You're not of God. That's just the plain facts of the gospel. He's been given a name that's above every name. And that was the Father's good pleasure to give Him that name. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world. It's all around us. That's why it's such a challenge for us. You know, folks, uh, they uh, move and they try to find them a good church. And they end up going into a church that, you know, maybe they've got all kinds of programs going on, but they don't believe the truth. They don't preach the doctrines of grace. They don't preach uh, salvation by grace. They don't preach the gospel. They don't preach church truth. And they get into these compromising churches. And the next thing you know, why they don't even care about being a Baptist. They'll become a Methodist or a, a Presbyterian or whatever. Breaks my heart. How in the world someone would get so far away from the truth that you would stop being a Baptist? It's like the old fellow said, if I wasn't a Baptist, I'd be ashamed. That's the only thing I can say. I'd be ashamed. I'm not a Presbyterian because I don't believe in baptizing babies. And even though Calvin had a lot of truth, Calvin never was a part of one of the Lord's true churches and he actually persecuted true churches. So I'm not having any part of Presbyterians. I'm not a Methodist because they believe in salvation's half by grace and half by works. They started with men. Uh, 
They did not start with God. Pentecostalism, these other false religions, they're not of God. Many of them even deny the, the deity of Christ. And so here he says in, in chapter 4, verse 3, Every spirit that confesseth not that Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world. When we start taking a back seat from truth, it won't be long until we will take another one and another one and another one. And then before you know it, we just simply compromise the word of God and truth don't matter anymore. I pray the Lord never lets that happen in my life. I know it could, but I pray the Lord never lets that happen in my life. Second John, Second John, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Many deceivers are entered into the world. We could, I could name all 50 of them if we had time. Uh, different denominations, different so-called churches that deny the Godship of Jesus Christ. So, we see that 1 John 2.18 is a good example that uh, we're living in the last time and that uh, you know many people are ignorant about the Antichrist. They, what they've learned about Antichrist is from some movie. I think there's a movie called The Omen or uh, you know they've seen The Exorcist or some of these things and that's their idea of the Antichrist. Many times Satan will deceive people by having these Catholic folks to come into their home and make it appear like they've done something and that way he gets the person deceived into thinking that these people are really of the truth because he'll do anything to deceive to get you to deny the truth that uh, God has given in his word he is great at deception in fact this beast in Revelation 13, 12 and 13 talks about his great deception. And next time we're going to talk about the mark of the beast and the number of the beast in the rest of chapter 13. But I want you to remember that even in our world today, uh, there are many antichrists and uh, we see them on TV, we hear them on the radio, we see it in our uh, different communities uh, where they have, they do good things. I don't doubt that. There are people that feed the poor and they give rooms to people that are cold, and I'm glad for that. But we cannot overlook the error that they teach. Remember that in 2 Thessalonians 2 3, it talks about. Uh, the son of perdition, the man of sin. He's called the lawless one that shall arise. And uh, he has these uh, seven heads and ten horns and showing his great power and authority upon the earth. And until the Lord Jesus returns, in fact, the battle of Armageddon, as we'll eventually be studying, shows that a time will come when the enemies of our Lord the enemies of our Lord will be brought to an end and they'll gather to destroy the Lord and his people but the Lord will destroy them and bring to an end that great battle we, we are in a battle not against flesh and blood but against powers spiritual powers and um, we can rest in the promises of God that uh, 
we will have the victory in Christ. May the Lord bless you.